it's been my distinct honor and privilege to have known you for a long time. It's uh, I think it's coming up on over 20 years now. And you've been a, an inspiration and a personal role model to me. So I'm looking forward to this conversation today and want to keep it interactive and uh, special welcome to everybody out there who's part of the group and who has um, taken some time out of their schedules to join us today. So Jim, I want to kick us off with a little bit of a walk down memory lane. So there were only <laughs> 17. That's a long lane. It's a long lane, six decades wrong, right? So, well, it's um, there were only 17 authors, right? So it's a, a special privilege to be able to have one of the uh, co-authors or the authors of the Agile Manifesto with us today. First question to get us started off, what are some of your rec recollections of that historic event when you guys came together and signed the Agile Manifesto? I think it was in Provo, Utah, and you were skiing in between writing and signing. Yeah, well, let me talk about that for just a minute. But I also noticed before we went uh, to just you and I on the screen that you have another software luminary pioneer on, on board here and Tom oh. Gill. So I shout out to Tom. He's been... He's, uh, He's been doing this a long time and uh, has done some of the early work on evolutionary development. So let me talk a little bit about pre-manifesto and then we'll talk about the manifesto. So before the manifesto in about 1997, I went. To, I spoke at a conference in New Zealand and Martin Fowler was there. And so Martin and I met each other and got to know each other a little bit and kept in touch when he got back. And then he put me in touch with uh, Ken Kent Beck a couple of years later. And Kent Beck and I exchanged manuscripts. So I sent him my adaptive software development manuscript. He sent me his extreme programming explained uh, manuscript. And we realized that we had some commonality. And so Kent invited me to a meeting in Rogue River, Oregon in 2000, which was a meeting that kind of preceded the Agile Manifesto meeting. But it was focused on XP, and uh, there were mostly XP there, like Kent, uh, Ron Jeffries, uh, mm -hmm. Bob Martin, people like that. And so Bob Martin kicked off the next spring after this meeting and said, "Let's let's widen the the, the number of attendees and try to find people from various and sundry different agile or at that point we were called lightweight methodologies." And so that is what precipitated the manifesto meeting. A lot has been said about the manifesto uh, itself and about the meeting. And I'll just say a couple of things about it. It was a very unique meeting. I've been, in my six, nearly 60 years, I've been to a lot of meetings. Uh, this was probably one of the most productive. And we went into it without under, really knowing what we were going to do. We, we knew each of these people came from light methodologies, Scrum, XP, Adaptive, DSDM, Feature Driven, and but we did we hadn't really gotten together before to see what the commonalities were. We kind of ran this as a uh, open meeting, so in other words, we didn't have any agenda. We didn't when we started, we didn't have any plans about what the outcome would be. We just wanted to see what emer what emerged and. So we started off and all 17 people really talked about what they did. And as we went around the room, it became obvious that there were a lot of commonalities. And so we, the first thing we did was started out by putting a bunch of, we, we didn't like being called lightweight methodologists. And uh, particularly Alistair didn't like calling it lightweight, Alistair Coburn. Uh, he, he had several choice words to say about it. <laughs> And so uh, we, we needed to pick another name. So I don't know, there were 18 or 20 things on, the, you know, the labels on the board. And it, we sorted it down and finally came up with Agile. And one of the things that sort of, to me, epitomized the type of meeting this was, was an interaction that Alistair talked to me about when I was writing a book. And I talked to him for a while about various different aspects of Agile that he and I were involved in. And he told me about a, a sub meeting between he, Ron Jeffries, and, and Steve Miller hmm. during during the meeting. And they were off in the corner talking. And Steve Miller was the odd man out. In fact, when it came around to him talking about what he did, he said, I'm the spy from the structured methods groups. 
and and he, and he was he was he was more of a traditional methodologist structured yeah. methods and he and Ron Jeffries and Alistair got to talking and Steve was talking about his diagramming and what he was trying to do with all his diagramming and then Alistair said yeah but that means you've got the diagrams here and then you've got the code down here and you maintained to it maintain it two places and it'll get out of sync and we don't we don't like that and Steve said, no, you don't understand. I'm going to generate code from the diagrams. And so I'm only going to mend the in one place. And so Alistair and Ron said, oh, okay. The intent is the same as our intent. We don't think you can do it, but the intent is the same. And, and it's those kinds of things that cause people to go from agreeing or not agreeing to agreeing, and there were several of those kinds of things that happened. So it was a, it was the flavor of the meeting that was so positive, and of course it came up with uh, the, the four values and the twelve principles. A couple of things in retrospect. There's been a lot of misinterpretation of the word over in the manifesto. Individuals and interactions over process and tools. It doesn't say instead of, it says over. And a lot of people for whatever reason have chosen to, to say it's instead of, and there were some probably extreme agilists that believe that, but the, but the bulk of the agilists said, no, documentation is good, it's appropriate, but it has to support collaboration. Before the manifesto, a lot of the documentation was instead of the instead of uh, collaboration. I talked to a, a uh, enterprise architecture group in New Jersey one time, and they had just issued a corporate architecture manual. And I went down to the development staff and I said, "Well, what did you think of that?" And they said, "We don't understand it. We just put it in the bottom of the shelf of the drawer." And so I went back to the architecture group and I said, so how many meetings do you have scheduled to try to explain this document to the development staff? And they said, none, it should be obvious. But it obviously wasn't. And that's the kind of thing that we were, you know, we were kind of against there is documentation for documentation site and not for communications and collaboration site. And so sometimes the meaning of that has gotten has gotten lost over the years. Awesome. Anything else you can think about that stood out from that uh, signing manifesto meeting? And uh, I believe it's yeah. The one the one thing, and I got to thinking about this as I was writing this new book. And you know what is amazing and ironic, very ironic, is that seventeen basically techies came up with a set of values based on people and their interactions and collaboration. And that was, a, I think, a real key point. But you had you had people like Alistair in particular, who was really into the whole collaboration piece of it. And the rest of us were, too, to some extent. One of the funny things that happened was you got 17 people, all type A's, all either teachers or facilitators. And so we got into arguments in the beginning about how facilitation techniques. So somebody would be up there leading the meeting and somebody would say, well, I don't like your process. And so <laughs> what we had to do is we say, the person that's up at the front of the room gets to pick the process and don't argue about it anymore. Yeah, having been in some uh, other meetings with you, uh, where there's process arguments, I kind of can figure out what it must have seemed like. <laughs> but um, I, I do think that there's a note to me that to follow up and get Alistair on one of these uh, meet meetups, perhaps along with you, so that he can share some of the choice words that he had. <laughs> uh, uh, against the use of the term lightweight. I'm glad he won and you guys chose the term uh, agile instead of um, lightweight. All right. Uh, you mentioned the book and uh, you mentioned almost 60 years. I thought it was over 60 years. You've been in the industry for six decades or close to it, or just, just a little over. And uh, I, of course, read your book and I really believe it is an amazing uh, epic. It's a it's it's a fantastic read. I strongly recommend it. For me, it was learning about stuff that happened before, a little before my time, during the early days of my time, and then of course looking forward. So I see it as a roadmap of the past, present, and also of the future. And 
I mentioned that it is to you that is probably the best book that I've read in, in several years now. And it just for somebody who comes for anybody who comes with a passion for agile methods and anybody who's looking to learn about the essence, the sort of distilled essence of agile, they're going to find it in that book. So I want to ask you, as you're looking back um, six decades, what are maybe one, two, three of the key points you'd like to share of, with this audience here today about the past of software development and the past history of Agile? But one of the things that happened when I was writing the book is I got to the last chapter and I thought, well, maybe what I ought to do is write something to try to predict the future. And the future is so looking so turbulent. I said, well, that's probably a fool's errand to try to write about the future. But I realized at that point that I've been writing a history and that the, the purpose of this history was not to predict the future, but to prepare us for it. Hmm. And so I really think that is one of the reasons to look at the history. So, for example, one of the things we can talk about later is history gives us some perspective on sort of the current hype cycle of some of the new technologies. And if you just know, for example, what's going on in the last five years, you don't have that historical perspective to kind of bounce it off of. And so I think that's important. I think, so the purpose of history is not to predict the future, but to prepare for it. And so one of the things that I did in this book, and, and it, it was a bear to organize, was I braided together sort of five things, software development history, my own personal experiences that went with that. I wanted to honor the pioneers in the industry. I wanted to link that to the technology advancement over time. So for example, software development is really dependent on and and contributes to technology. Uh, what you see behind me is the technology in use in 1970 when I started working business systems development. You know, paper, car, punch cards in, paper out. And when you hit the enter key, basically to start the job, you were looking at 12 to 24 hours. So just think about every time you hit the enter key today, if it took 12 hours, how long it would take you to develop software. And then, then the other thing was the management theory. And all of those things are connected. And so if I had one piece of advice for people, I'd say be cognizant in each of those areas. Even if you're a software developer, you need to know what's going on in technology and you need to know what's going on kind of historically in order to prepare for the future. And preparing for the future, uh, I have a little saying that I've been use, using recently, learn like a bonsai tree. And that came, that came about because I, I got a chance to visit the National Arboretum in Washington, D.C. a couple of months ago. And the bonsai exhibit just kind of held my fascination. And you'd look at this bonsai tree, and on every tree, there was a label. It said, in training since. And some of them went back to the 19 to the 1600s, and a lot of them to the 1800s and the early 1900s, you know. And that was just really something else in training for 400 years, and and I think that's a good model or, or metaphor for what we need to do both as an industry and our personal lives, our personal careers, is learn like a bonsai. And so I think one of the things that that's important is not only company and business tra transformations but to make sure that we as individuals keep up our personal transformations so that we don't get left behind. Thank you very much. So I'm gonna jump into our third question here, since you mentioned a little bit about the future and its sort of innate turbulence. We've just come out of the pandemic and in the agile space, there's a fragmentation, there are different methodologies, different certification uh, frameworks. And on one hand, Everyone on this call, all of us, are dealing with a very turbulent present and um, perhaps a more turbulent future. And on the other hand, uh, there is a fragmentation in terms of thought, met method, and concepts in what constitutes agile. So I wanted to ask you, just kind of looking forward, even like as you say, you know, we can't really predict the future, you have to prepare for it. What are some of the key things or key advice you would give to our audience as it pertains to Agile itself, as you see it, you know, because you co-invented Agile. Well, one of the things is I've sort of been out of the Agile loop for a while mm -hmm. because I've been I was working for ThoughtWorks 
for about the last 10 years until I retired two years ago. And I was working on a lot of internal stuff at ThoughtWorks. I was working on digital transformations and writing a book on digital transformations and wasn't connecting as much with the Agile community. That has changed in the last year as I've started to write this book. and I've actually gotten more excited about it. And one of the things that I've gotten kind of excited about is this idea of sort of trying to rejuvenate the Agile movement. We're not going to go back and rewrite the manifesto. That's that's a done deal. It happened 23 years ago. It was a particular time. It was a particular place. It was a particular group of people. It ain't going to happen again. But I this is somebody invents time travel. That's right. Um, but I think I think there's there's a need to kind of rejuvenate and re-excite people about agile and what it can mean not only to businesses but to further people further. From in, in other kinds of organizations. And so I think that's really important. So there's kind of a movement of rejuvenating Agile. Uh, one group is calling it back to the, I've called it back to the basics, forward to the future. So I think that's one of the things going on It's because it's important. But I think that the, the importance here for businesses and for people and for organizations is not necessarily Agile methodologies, but it's agility. Agile methodologies methodologies may come and go. You may have Scrum, and then you have XP, and then you've got Excalibur. And Excalibur takes the best from AI and quantum computing and rolls it up into a methodology in which you can do, you know, three years worth of work in two weeks. I, I'm just, you know, sort of playing devil advocate there. But the, re, the rationale behind that is to become more agile. And so I like to, to talk about methods, methodologies, and mindset. And the mindset of agility is the thing that's really the most important. And, you know, I think there are going to be a lot of turbulence and discontinuities caused by the things that you talked about a few minutes ago. Climate change, pandemic, geopolitical turmoil, social justice movements, AI, quantum computing. And those things are going to interact in ways we cannot predict. And it's going to happen faster and faster. Some, just think about the 1980s and think about a clock going around. In the 1990s, it started going a little faster. In the 2000s, it started going a little faster. You can't even see the hands today. <laughs> it's spinning so fast. And so we've got to we've got to be able to respond to those kinds of changes, and it's not going to be easy. Thank you. And as a, as a point underscoring what you just said, I was reading this morning that uh, the Threads application has reached 100 million users faster than even chat gpt it's a matter of days not even weeks so definitely uh, the clock spinning at an, uh, at an incredible rate uh, i'm going to jump into some of the audience questions and tom i have a question up there but i since jim was talking about the agile mindset uh jun long has uh, is asking uh, they say that people always, always use the term agile methodology and they say that agile is just a mindset or a set of four values and 12 principles. What's your opinion of that, Jim? I would say that there is an agile mindset, which ha which is more defined by the manifesto. Then there are a number of agile methodologies that cover, my definition of methodology is it, it combines practices and a process. So for example, waterfall is a methodology, is a, is a process behind a methodology. Iter iterative development is a process behind a, me a particular methodology. So a methodology is a combination of methods and processes and documentation and a, a kind of a life cycle from beginning to end. So from all the way from inception, all the way down through delivery and DevOps and, and production. And, and, and then methods are like uh, refactoring would be a method. So you, there may be a number of methods incorporated into a methodology, all driven by a mindset. And the mindset is an agility mindset. So I would say that the, what's in the manifesto is more mindset oriented. And, and I think that needs to be reiterated for people. And that methodologies are, you've got a number of different methodologies that are agile methodologies like XP and Scrum and DSDM and Adaptive and Crystal and, you know, Scrum 3 plus 4, 34, or, you know, whatever comes comes next are different methodologies, but they all follow that agility mindset. Thank you. I'm going to jump into uh, Tom's question. Tom Gill, this is uh, none other than Tom. Tom, thanks for joining us again. 
And Tom asks, how well does the Agile Manifesto align with the principles that lead to success in product development? So, Agile Manifesto align. Well, one of the one of the things that that I I find about the manifesto is that there is a group of people who take it very literally. If it says programmed, it means programmed. Yeah, you know, uh, programs over documentation. And there's another group of people who can interpret the, the manifesto and say, yes, the, I can substitute product in there and it's, <laughs> excuse me, and it works just fine. I can substitute the word solution in there and it works just fine. So it's more the understanding of the manifesto and being able to extend it that I think is, is why it's going to be remain useful. If you if you stick to the exact words of the manifesto, you may it may not be as useful in the future. But for example, in my project management book, I used all different uh, guidelines or, or values, but they I can I can trace them all back to the Adam Manifesto principles. Awesome, thank you. Speaking of your previous books, I'd like to switch gears and ask you some. Uh, questions about your earlier work. This is the kind of stuff that inspired me and um, frankly changed the direction of my career. And I can save my life because of that. Uh, in particular, your concept of complex adaptive systems or complexity theory that you pulled in from the Santa Fe Institute and elsewhere. Um, can you talk a little bit about that and how it imbued a, a lot of your earlier writing? I don't see it too much in more your more recent works. There's a little bit of that in every book, uh, not quite as much as in the in the first book, but it's it's still there. So when I was writing my first book, it started out being about rapid application development, and my version of that was called radical software development, and that was the title of the book that I started working on. And as the more I wrote, the more I found that there was a chapter three that was missing. I didn't know what went in there, but I knew it was missing. And, and, and it was the theoretical or conceptual base for which the, I was developing methods and, and practic practices uh, to do things iteratively, iteratively and to do showcases and, and those kinds of things. And so I happened upon an article in, I think it was Harvard Business Review, that talked about complex adaptive systems and, and, a, and a metaphor for how organizations how organizations, complex organizations, whether it be cells or human or groups, work. And to me, it was an excellent mental model for how for the change in mindset required for agility. And so it talked about adaptation as a way, you know, how did how does how did evolution move forward? What were the the mechanisms of, of adaptation uh, that, that Darwin talked about? It talks about the edge of chaos and emergence. And an emergent practice is one, or an emergent result is one that becomes a, comes about from the interaction of agents, but there's no cause and effect relationship. You get a bunch of people together and you talk and you collaborate and you don't know what's going to come out of that. But, and whatever comes out says, whoa, that's pretty decent, you know, but you can't really check. You couldn't duplicate that. You know, you couldn't duplicate the Agile Manifesto because, again, that was a particular time, particular pace. A particular group of people, uh, and and what the Agile Manifesto is prime example of an emergent result, one that you didn't plan on, but one that just occurred, and so again and again that happens at the edge of chaos, which means not too much structure, not too little structure, but kind of in the middle at a balance point, and that's one of the things I find is the hardest for managers to deal with in Agile, and actually anybody to deal with in Agile, is those balance points of, you know, not enough structure, too much structure, not enough time, too much time. It, it is all a balancing act. Uh, there was a uh, another biologist called John Holland who looked at Darwin's survival of the fittest and said, that's not enough. He said, if you, if you, if you look at Darwin's theory, he said evolution would be about the equivalent uh, as, as a tornado going through a junkyard and assembling a Boeing 747. And he said there's another thing at work, and it's arrival of the fittest, by which he meant the collaboration of agents to produce emergent outcomes. 
And, and then the last part of complexity theory that appealed to me was this idea of simple rules, that you don't need a bunch of complex rules and regulations. What you need is, a, is several simple rules that guide people with, and don't don't tell them exactly how to do stuff, but, but guides people in their work. And so those are some of the things that I took out of complex adaptive systems theory. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to pick one question from here since we're talking about books. Uh, Michael is asking, Jim, of what book are you most proud of? I would have to say my first one and my last one. It, it is a, it's a sort of a tie, although the last one, it, you know, kind of it sticks in my mind. And the reason for the last one is that it's very personal. And that was a struggle during the writing of this book to, to know how much of myself to put in a book because I've been writing about project management. I've been writing about software development. I've been writing about digital transformations. And here I was writing a book that was about me. And there was a lot of anxiety around that, you know, writing about yourself, kind of putting yourself out there. Uh, and it, finally, I came to the, I, and, and, and I had some help put, that pushed me, uh, Martin Fowler, for one, uh-huh. really helped me a lot and pushed me into doing more of that. Mike Cohn did, too. Uh, and finally, I sat down and I said, you know, why am I anxious about this? I'm 77 years old. What the hell are they going to do to me? <laughs> yeah, Thank you so much for that personal and uh, somewhat vulnerable uh, comment. Really appreciate that. Uh, I've known you, uh, Jim, personally, personally to be a tremendous ally and advocate for so many people in the Agile community. You've done so much in the Agile community, a lot of, be- a lot of it behind the scenes. So I'd like you to talk a little bit about that. And just so that our audience knows, and even for posterity, uh, I'd like you to talk about your work about the Agile community. For example, we mentioned Alistair. And as I understand, it was Alistair and you who put that first conference together, the first Agile, uh, what's now the series of the Agile Alliance conferences, right? I think it was 2002. Is that correct? Yeah. You talk about that. Yeah. So literally... This was one of the, you know, the the back of the napkin meetings. And Alistair and I sat down at either lunch or coffee. We both lived in Salt Lake City at the time. And we both sat down. We'd both been to XP conferences. And we we decided that there needed to be an Agile conference. And so he and I sat and talked about this a little bit. Uh, at some point, we got Ken Schwaber involved in it. And I don't remember exactly the timing of that. And then at the Cutter conference in 2002, Myself, Alistair, and Todd Little from Landmark Graphics were there. And we got to talking. And again, it was one of these back of the napkin meetings. And I actually have a picture of the back of the napkin in the book. So Todd Little had kept that. And, and I'm grateful to him for that. So there's a picture of the back of the scribbling on the back of the napkin. And so Alistair and I had some ideas about the conference and Alistair had some design ideas in terms of not just presentations, but you know, small groups, open space, discussion groups to try to get people together and talking and, and interacting and collaborating, something that they could take on beyond the conference. And and then Todd brought Alistair and I knew what we wanted to do. Todd knew how to do it because he had put together several worldwide conferences for landmark graphics. So we owe a lot to Todd for that. And in fact, the the Agile Manifesto people, there are a whole lot of people that came after that who really pushed the movement. And I, we're really grateful to all of them. People like you, Sanji, people like Mike Cohn, people like uh, Josh Karievsky. So there's a whole cadre of people that sort of expanded on what the 17 had done. And and we, we owe a lot to those people also. And Todd's one of those because Todd was the backbone of that conference for several years. Uh, Alistair never forgave me for moving away from Salt Lake City in the middle of the planning for the, con- for the con- uh, first Agile conference. Uh, and then after that, some of us in the in the 17, uh, it happened about the same time as the conference, decided that we had called ourselves the Agile Alliance in the manifesto meeting, but there was no formal organization. And so a bunch of us got together and started the Agile Agile Alliance as well as the Agile Conference. And a little, excuse me, a little later, those things got connected. But I, in looking and doing some research for this book, I was looking through some old emails and I found some of the original documents that uh, were, there were organizational documents for the Agile Alliance. 
and I passed them on to some of the current people. One of the things I looked at said that our first budget for the Agile Alliance was $7,500 a year. Awesome. $7,500 a year. I bet it's uh, several magnet year. orders of magnitude <laughs> larger now. Um, you know, since the first conference were like 250 people, and now it's 2,000. Yeah, you know, that's true. I was, uh, it was quite an incredible event. Um, one of the things I remember personally from a conversation with Alistair, he said that he's paid a lot of attention, he and you did, and Todd as well, to the interactions since we're talking about complexity theory and interactions between people and emergent behavior. He's, he and he thought of it as setting out these spaces as, as almost like gardens. And people would move, move around and collaborate and all that. So that sort of metaphor is stuck in my head uh, for the last 20 years or so. But I want to talk a little bit about a particular group of people um, somewhat uh, vilified in, in the Agile community, and that's managers and executives. And I know you have always been an advocate for managers and executives since you come from a background of management, which many others in the agile community necessarily don't necessarily come from management themselves. They might come from software development or business analysis and such. And even today, it seems like within the agile community, we don't have a clear message for executives. Now, I know from history that you and Pat Reed created the first I believe it is the very first Agile Executive Summit on behalf of the Agile Alliance. Could you talk a little bit about why you went about doing that? What was your message for executives in those days? And what's your message for executives in 2023? Well, one of the things I did in a book is, is I laid out the Agile, Agile, Agile timeline. And it was really into three segments. The first segment was rogue teams when you basically were doing teams were doing agile, but organizations really weren't doing agile. The second was what I call the courageous executive era when you mm -hmm. actually got executives saying, oh, we really need our whole organization to be agile. And then the third era, which I'll call digital transformation, which is where companies, big companies decided they needed to be more agile. So it wasn't just IT. It was more of the company. And so there's been that kind of progression there are a number of companies that are still left in the rogue team era, you know, so there, there, there are laggards that are still there. And, and so the, the message to, for me is just like there was, a, as you well know, there was a backlash against project management in a lot of the Agile community. And so we came up with some new words like Scrum Master. And so, you know, to, so that we leave the project management label behind. Nobody, one of the things that occurred to me as I was writing this book is, is the programming development job changed a lot too. And nobody decided to change the name of that, but they wanted to change the name of the project manager. Uh, but as, as you know, I was involved in, in some of the original work with the Agile, Agile Leadership Network and with PMI and their push into Agile project management. So I think it's not the... It's the type of project management. It's the mindset of project management that's important as you move in and you get more agile. And I think that's that's correct all the way up the ladder. I think that you need a leader at every level to take to take on a full agile digital transformation, and that means from the COO, from the CEO, all the way down. And one of the things I talk about in the book is I think one of the characteristics for those leaders is they have to be adventurous. They have to be willing to step out and make some, take some risk. And that's why I call the second age, the second uh, era of Agile, the courageous executive era, because I've got a couple of case studies in there about some executives who really stepped out and took the bull by the horns and made some decisions that were risky, but they, they paid out in the end. I think we, we're entering such a time in history when the need to be adaptive is throughout the organization. Uh, I just ran across a McKinsey study that said their projection is by 2027, there'll only be 25% of the companies that are currently in the system, S&P 500, that will remain. 75% of the companies that are currently in the S&P won't survive the next four years. You know, and that's not going to be 
solved by software development or product development or project management. That's going to be solved by executive change. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the, one of the things that we're talking about when we talk about business agility is that kind of change at the whole organization level, which is going to be hurtful. But, you know, you don't want to end up in that 75 percent. So what's going to hurt more doing it or not doing it? So I think there's a real imperative and some companies are doing pretty well and some companies are. not And I think it's going to be a big shakeout in the next few years. Thank you very much. We're going to segue a little bit into the audience questions as we sort of close down the uh, time on the clock. I want to pick up a question from Jay. Jay says the manifesto identifies uh, or the website. Today, Agile has penetrated many other fields, including academics, public relations, uh, public relations, farming, et cetera. Uh, What are your thoughts on this expansion from software development into these other disciplines, I believe? Oh, I I think it's inevitable because when you when you look at what's going on in the world, Agility is the mindset that's needed to fix a lot of those things. Uh, whether you're a nonprofit, whether you're doing products. In fact, if you if you remember, and you probably do, Sandy, that my Agile Project Management book is about software and products. There's a lot of product stuff in there, not just project stuff. And I think that's kind of inevitable. And one of the things I like that I'm seeing today is a lot of emphasis on product and product ownership and product management and trying to define what a product owner or manager really does. And there's a lot of discussion. Back in the 1990s in IT organizations, there was no such thing as product management. There were were people who came to the IT that helped put the requirements and the the project together, but they were not product managers by any stretch of the imagination. In software companies, there tended to be product managers but they still didn't have enough of them. One of the things that Agile pointed out as we started doing more and more Agile projects and organizations, it, we, we figured out that what was sorely ma- ma- missing was enough product management and enough testing. And mm-hmm. so th- those were two of the things that the Agile movement kind of uncovered. And now people are really moving solidly into the product management area. Thank you. Um, we have a process question, but this is about the process that you all followed when you wrote the uh, manifesto. Ben asks, how did you all decide when the manifesto was done? We ran out of time. <laughs> no, um, that's a good question. I think we we left the meeting pretty satisfied with the four value statements and the, six, the 12 principles we did online after the meeting. And it took us three or four months to get through those, and it only took us two days to get through the the values. So there's a there's a benefit in being together. I think we got more uh, discussion uh, after you, you know on the pr- principles than we did on the on the value statements uh, because we had time to to do it. And you know we people argued a lot more a lot more about the phrasing. Given the time we put into it, I think the value statements are are pretty amazing in terms of their coverage and what they include. And in that vein, Jun Long has a question and says, it's a curious question for most audiences, but did the 17, other than, of course, uh, uh, Mike Beadle, uh, rest in peace, um, did you guys think about adjusting those and did you get together again? Number one, uh, we've been asked about adjusting the manifesto for years, and the answer has been a solid no from everybody. <laughs> if you want to, if you want a new, a new manifesto, you got to figure out another group of people to do it. And and one of the things is again, in the early two thousands, the lightweight community man, uh, methodology community was very small. Now it's huge. Depends on who you talk to, but it, you know it may include you know seventy or eighty percent of the companies in the world say they're agile. Whether they are or not is incidental, but they at least give voice to that. And so you'd never get a group of people together today to write a new manifesto that's going to appeal to everybody. So maybe what you need is an extension to the manifesto for each of those major branches rather than a rewrite of the manifesto. So the question of do we all get together again, at the 2011 Agile Development Conference, there was a program and we all got uh, 
introduced again, and, and there was a panel discussion. So, and I don't remember how many of the 17 were there. Quite a few were there at that 10th year anniversary. Uh, since that 10th year anniversary, any efforts to do that have kind of fallen on deaf ears. Yeah, I do remember that, I guess, in the late late 2020 and then over 2021, uh, in my podcast series, I, I think I ended up with 10 of, 10 of the 17. Uh, so the Agile Karen Sarai, and maybe somebody can pop a link over there. So maybe not all of you together, but individual conversations. Right. Roger has a question. Uh, Roger says, I see much value in combining lean with agile. What does Jim think about the role of lean? Small batches, whip limits, flow optimization, waste reduction through Kaizen, et cetera. Some people would say that that is separate from agile. I think that's another tool in the agilist toolbox. And if lean helps, helps you do things, I think that's fine. I think there's some real value. I mean, for example, the idea of building teams around value streams, I think is extremely valuable because it's going from a project orientation to a product or orientation. And I think that's the way to go. And, and so I think those things, there's, there's value in lean. Some people say DevOps is separate. Some people say DevOps is inside. I say one of the things that, that I believe about methodology is there are two different fundamental types. They're prescriptive methodologies and generative methodologies. And a prescriptive methodology would be something like, like uh, SAFE that tries to define just about everything you would need, ever need in an organization. If you take some of the individual components of SAFE, they're actually pretty good. The problem is trying to apply that to, for example, a middle or small size project. There's, there's things you got to take away and not do. And I've always found that taking away and not doing was really hard because any given little piece of it, you can say, does that look like it might be useful? And you say, yeah, that looks like it might be useful. That's a prescriptive methodology. And I know some of the safe people would disagree with that category, categorization. Then there's a generative methodology. So you start with something like extreme programming and you say, extreme programming doesn't have any, everything I need. So what do I need to add to extreme programming? Well, maybe I need to add DevOps. So I go out and get some DevOps stuff and I'll add it to my extreme programming methodology. And maybe I need to do some lean value tree stuff. So I'll bring in some lean values tree stuff and I will generate the methodology I need for my particular situation. And every time it may be different. And I think some people are concerned that, that you need too much uh, experience and knowledge to do that. And my answer is, yeah, but it's the only thing that's going to work well. Thank you very much. And I think that'll bring us to my last question. And I want to make this a generational question. So you talked about different types of narratives in your book, and I think you call it a braided narrative. I think what we face in today's world is a braided workforce combining baby boomers, Gen Xers, millennials, and uh, now Gen Zers as well, right? Um, so I've always known you to be an optimist. And I think our message should always be a message of hope and optimism for the future. And so, you know, question to you, what's your message of hope and optimism for the latest generation, Gen Z, 25, 30 years or, or less, whatever that cutoff is, <laughs> as we hand the baton over to this next generation? Well, in, in you know, if you go strictly by the numbers, I'm even pre-baby boomer. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> by one year. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, that makes your greatest generation, I think, is that. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, there, there are times, particularly during the pandemic, when you're hunkered down in your basement trying to figure out where, where the world's going, well, yeah. that you, it's, hard to, it's hard to maintain that hope. Uh, I, I don't know, right, writing this book and seeing my grandkids grow up, you know, it really stokes me that, that you know, Hopefully the younger people will take over fairly quickly and help things out a little bit uh, because I see I see those kinds of things going on. I see you know more diversity happening. Uh, you know I think we we have some big challenges and some huge challenges, and a lot of that I think it, it revolves around you know the biggest two challenges are geopolitical and climate. 
I mean, you look at what's happened in just the climate in the last week or two here in the U.S., and, you know, part of the country is burning up and the other part is flooding to death. And and so that's, I think we're, we're becoming more and more aware that that's a, a, a crisis. But I also think that, and I really believe this, that agility and the ability to be more agile, to be more adaptive, is going to be one piece of the thing that helps save us. And so that's why I'm pushing agility back up into the business organization and beyond. I think if you look at some of the key leaders in the world, like the former prime minister in New Zealand, that they exhibit some characteristics of an adaptive leader. And I think that's what we're going to need more of. So I, I'm cautiously optimistic. Well, thank you so much uh, for those words of wisdom, Jim. And thank you so much once again for joining us.